Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> okay, I want to start with a pop quiz. Question number one. Is this a unit test? And you can, you can raise your hand or whatever if you think so. Really? No, no one? <laughs> okay, a few people. Yeah, that's, what, that's more like what I respect. Um, okay, what about this one? Slightly different. Is this a unit test? No hands. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about this one? Okay, controversy. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I am um, I'm very preoccupied with these kinds of questions. Uh, I tend to think about these things maybe too much. Uh, I'm, I'm more well. I'm interested in the, the, the of course the general question like what is a unit test, and uh, the answer to this and all, all these questions, uh, it, just like any other question to do with computers, uh, turns out to be it, it depends. Um, so, in a sense, everyone was right. <laughs> so, well done to you. Um, now, I don't know about uh, you, but uh, this, um, I'm kind of used to this answer, you know, it depends, we hear this a lot, but I'm, I'm kind of frustrated uh, with this answer when it comes to unit testing. And I want to ask, you know, why? Why don't we know what a unit test is? Uh, surely we've had long enough uh, to find out. Now, <laughs> the answer to this question I think uh, it's maybe precisely because we, we haven't had long enough. Yeah, unit testing is, is kind of new in the grand scheme of things. Well, uh, the sense, or in the sense of automated uh, developer tests, uh, it's kind of new. Um, and here's what I think happened. Um, before TDD, it was kind of awful. And, uh, and then this comes on the scene. And we, uh, we all got really excited about this. and. Uh, there's a, a you know explosion of, of writing, and uh, talks about TTD and testing and so on, uh, but we never actually sat down to you know decide what the the terms that we were talking about actually meant. Um, and of course, time went on, and we uh, tried to solve this problem in the same way that we often solve problems in software, which is uh, rather than tackle it head on, we um, we just made up more terms. <laughs> uh, and here's a sample of some of them here. You may have seen some of these. Um, but uh, this is not what I want to talk about. Um, I'm really only interested in, in uh, two of these terms, at least, because uh, I think the other ones are largely, uh, are largely qualifications of, of these like, two main kinds. And of course, I'm talking about unit tests and integration tests. And uh, I put the third one here, test isolation. Um, although this isn't like a, uh, a category in the same order as of the first two, that uh, I think I think this is going to be quite important uh, when we talk about these two things. Um, as I think I think test isolation is probably the the distinguishing thing, or the thing that distinguishes these these two things. Of course, assuming that they are totally separate and different, which they they may not be in your world. Uh, but for the, for the purpose of this discussion, uh, let's just assume that they are. Uh, it'll make things a lot easier. And then we can just go back to whatever you believe before. Okay, so. Um, the reason the, that it depends is I think because this, uh, this term isolation can mean different things to different people. And I want to look at uh, a couple of different contrasting views of what that might mean. So to, to begin with, uh, let's look at um, a kind of tester. I'm going to call this type A. Uh, and type A tester uh, has the assumption that uh, units, uh, these individual parts of our application, are, are identified with classes. Now, this is, of course, uh, assuming that we're dealing with an object-oriented type paradigm. Uh, I think for this uh, talk, uh, let's just assume that we are. This is a Ruby meetup. Um, so, yeah, so uh, unit tests are, are concerned with uh, the, the classes, the, the, these the sort of arbitrary ways that we uh, organize code in, in, uh, in Ruby. Uh, and they're unit tests because they're isolated from the other classes in our system. 
Uh, that's what makes them unit tests. Um, now, the way we do that is typically we, you know, we use test doubles that we stop, uh, sorry, stub or, or mock out the collaborators. Um, and for this reason, uh, type A tends to favor what we call outside in development. Uh, if, if you're not sure what that means, it's basically uh, we start uh, developing a feature at the, the, the user interface uh, layer and our, our systems, can, well, our system is composed of layers and uh, we, we stub, up, stub out the implementation of the things we depend upon as we go and uh, gradually work our way down. Um, so by contrast, integration tests to type A, um, this means uh, basically combining um, different classes and testing, testing them out as they work together to ensure that we haven't made any, any glaring errors in our assumptions about um, our, our test doubles, essentially. So let's look at some uh, pros and cons of, of type A. Um, one of the claims that type A has is that they get better test feedback. Uh, you may be wondering uh, better than what? Well, um, that will be clear as we compare that to uh, some other ideas. Uh, but the central idea comes down to that uh, because, um, uh, because they've identified uh, units as, as these individual classes, um, that uh, essentially what happens is that you should only get one, t uh, one failure uh, per regression. Um, uh, now, Kent Beck, in his, uh, his book, Test Driven Development, which is sort of the, the book that, that started everything off, um, I think, <laughs> um, he, he identifies this as one of the, uh, the important things that he looks for in, in developing a good test suite. Um, so yeah, if you, have, if you have one regression, you want to have one uh, failure appear in your test report uh, telling you exactly what went wrong. Um, so that's what we mean by, by good feedback. Um, another claim that uh, type A has is that because they uh, are having to um, specify the, the uh, interfaces um, up front before they've actually thought about the implementation of, of uh, their, these, uh, these layers, uh, this leads to smaller, uh, tighter interfaces, uh, smaller things that are more manageable, all things we are identified with uh, good design. Um, now, the uh, detractors of type A have a few criticisms. Uh, one is that um, because we are specifying the, uh, the, the, the messages that we're passing in, uh, in all our tests uh, to um, the, the subjects, collaborators, uh, our tests become tightly coupled uh, to the implementation. So, for instance, if we have uh, a module A and uh, it's uh, depended upon by uh, modules B, C, and D, um, we, we can't change that relationship easily uh, without either, um, either breaking everything or having to update a lot of tests that really have nothing to do with the, um, the, the thing that we're, uh, we're trying to change. So for this reason, people say that, that this approach is, uh, means it's hard to refactor because we, um, we can't make a change without having to update our tests. And that undermines our confidence that we, um, we've preserved the behavior of the system. Um, so let's come back again. Now, um, who are these people that uh, are critics of, of type A? Uh, I'm going to call them type B, uh, for just for now. Uh, they have a slightly uh, different idea. Um, their idea of units is much more of a kind of fuzzy, uh, less dependent on the, the features of the language and, and more like uh, I get to decide what my, my units are. Um, and uh, for type B, units could be, um, it could be as small as uh, a single method. It could be whole uh, groups of, of classes working together. Um, it, it can't easily be identified with, uh, with a single structure in language. Um, now, uh, type B tends to, um, for this reason, uh, avoid the, uh, the use of mocks um, because uh, it's not an issue for them. They, they're quite happy mixing uh, classes together. Um, and they also tend to favor what we call middle out development. Um, now, uh, conversely, middle out means basically because you, um, because you don't have uh, the, uh, as much stubbing going on, you, uh, you, it's, it's generally better for you to start at the, the domain layer and build up larger uh, units of, of, uh, of uh, features and so on. This doesn't mean that they uh, can't do outside in. Um, 
it, it should be, well, it should be stated that um, mocks uh, are not the same thing as, as stubbing, and, and stubbing uh, is okay to type B. Um, it's just that there, you'll probably find that it's, it's used more judiciously. Um, so yeah, they te tend to favor middle out, um, not necessarily so. Now, um, what does this, uh, what does integration mean then for, um, for type B? Um, it doesn't, it, it's not, got nothing to do like uh, type A uh, asserts with, um, with the structures of our language. Uh, for type B, it has more to do with um, isolated from what we call the world or changing the world. Um, this typically means talking to uh, the database or something across the network or touching the file system and so on. And um, for type B, integration tests uh, are the, the tests that go across these boundaries to, to, um, to ensure that when you, you know, for instance, when you plug in your database and you switch it on, it doesn't explode. Okay. So um, this also fits in with uh, one of the goals that Ken Beck talks about, um, where he identifies um, isolation as, uh, as, as uh, a way of ensuring that our tests are not order dependent, that uh, one test is not uh, going to break because of something another test does. Um, uh, no, this is also sort of implied by uh, type A. But um, this, this version of isolation is much more in line with, with what Ken Beck says. Um, now, these, uh, these two approaches seem, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting out of myself. Um, let's, yeah, let's look at the, uh, the pros and cons first of, uh, of type B. Okay, so this is, as, as you might expect, uh, a sort of inverse image of type A, um, where type A, we said that they were more uh, tightly coupled. Uh, type B tends to be uh, uh, more loosely coupled. Uh, we don't have to go updating our stubs and mocks uh, so often when we change things. And for this reason, uh, people commonly say that this is easy, makes it easier to refactor. Um, uh, detractors, the type A types, uh, typically say that this also um, means that we, we get less feedback on the design of uh, the small parts of our application uh, because we're not having to specify the messages that are passing around in our application. We, um, we, we don't get that feedback in the body of our tests. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean your code will be any worse for it. Uh, it just means that precisely that you won't get um, the, the feedback uh, that, that, that type A tends to, to rely on to, uh, to make better design. Uh, another, another thing that people say is that um, uh, in combining um, all these different parts of the, these different classes, um, type B is more prone to what we call cascading failures. So for instance, if there is a, a module that is um, is used sort of throughout your application and you have a single regression there, um, you might find that uh, whole portions of your test suite are now red and you may have no idea what, what happened, uh, which sort of uh, goes against um, the, the first principle that we talked about that Kent Beck identifies as a, one of the goals he wanted. Um, you might also find that um, in, uh, in using a, a lot of different uh, classes and testing those together, you may find that in um, and having to reach through the complexity of, of, uh, of different uh, methods and, and paths, uh, uh, paths out of those methods uh, in order to, to get to something that's uh, several objects removed, uh, you may find that you, your, your tests become much more complex. Uh, they're, they're harder to set up, and it's harder to, to achieve like good test coverage. Now, I'm not saying any of these things as if they are hard facts. Uh, these are just these are mainly the, the the things that you'll you'll hear when people talk about these two different kinds. And um, typically, well, what, what I've seen in, in my experience is that people um, can have sometimes vicious arguments about the uh, the relative uh, benefits and drawbacks of these these approaches. And I think that's unfortunate because. Um, well, um, for one, I think sometimes people are not talking about the same thing. Um, if, you, if you think about, for instance, type A's definition of units, um, it might seem to type A that type B um, is writing integration tests um, across the board. Um, and so often we, we have these arguments about, about what's test, and it turns out that we might actually be talking about different things, even though we're using the same language. Um, 
I think also it, it should be clear in laying out um, the, the pros and cons that um, no single approach seems to have everything and there might be trade-offs associated um, with, with every decision we make. Um, so rather than try to assert that one of these is better than the other, uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to, um, to try both. Uh, and this is something that uh, Martin Fowler talks about um, in his article, Stubbs, I think Stubbs aren't mocks. Um, and here Martin Fowler actually identifies um, or coins names for these two types. Uh, he calls those the, the mockist type, which I've, I've called type A, and the, the classicist. Um, and one of the things I think is really good about um, this, this article is that Fowler uh, states that even though he, he's, uh, he strongly prefers one of them, and it may be uh, clear which one by the by virtue of the, 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 the terms that he's picked for the two, um, the, the, but that even, the, even though he prefers one, um, he has been known to write tests in the other style and it was okay. And um, this is something that I want to cultivate. Um, not, no single approach may be appropriate um, for, for everything that you're testing. Um, each one seems to suggest a certain architectural style that you may not have control over. Um, so I want to encourage you, if you do strongly identify with one of these approaches, or if you're just not sure which one you are, um, I, I'd like to encourage you to try both and have them both in your tool set. Now, um, I, uh, I got interested in these, these ideas uh, a few years ago, and I was, I was really excited about learning this stuff, because um, I thought, you know, if I learned the tools uh, to test, it would, it would make me a better developer. But one of the things I found was that um, even though these things seem very clear in, uh, in isolated examples, I found it really hard to apply what I'd learned in my day-to-day -day, uh, work. And I think I now know what the uh, reason for that was. Uh, like many of you here, I'm, I'm sure, uh, my day-to-day -day work is, is as, as a, a web developer. Um, I'm a, uh, I, I, I use a, a quite a common um, web application framework. And I think this framework has some opinions of its own that don't, don't make it easy to apply uh, these principles. Uh, so I just want to look at that uh, just to, to round things off to see uh, what we might do about that. Now, I'm not into uh, pointing fingers, so I'm going to just refer to this framework uh, for the means of this discussion um, as, as X on Rails. <laughs> um, now, X on Rails uh, has some, uh, some strong opinions about high-level architecture. And uh, this, is, this is one of the things that um, has made it really popular. Um, I'm just going to call it Rails from, from now on for brevity. Um, should that be Ruby on X? Never mind. OK. So um, Rails has this idea of uh, omakase. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, otherwise known as the, the chef's choice. Uh, you might know it as convention over configuration. The idea being that um, uh, Rails comes from with some sensible defaults, and those defaults have been uh, sort of labored over by really smart people. Um, and generally, your life is easier if you just go along with, uh, with Rails and what it does rather than try to fight um, the framework. Uh, generally, your life is going to be a lot easier if you do this than if you um, you know, you abandon some part of the framework and, and decide to implement your own. Uh, you're going to lose all the, the documentation and the community support um, out there. And, you know, just generally your, your life's going to be harder in trying to integrate your, your different approach with Rails. Um, so for this reason, I, I think this is a really good thing. Um, but I kind of disagree when it comes to testing. Um, now, if you generate a new Rails app today, you'll end up with, uh, well, a bunch of files and folders. Uh, but one of these folders, your test folder, uh, will probably look something uh, like this. Now, if I didn't know anything about Rails, um, I might assume that my integration tests uh, go here. I don't know if this is going to work. Probably not. But um, <laughs> um, we have a, a an integration test folder, or integration folder. Um, and I might assume that the other things are concerned with unit tests. Uh, the reason that, or the, 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 where I'm getting these assumptions from is uh, what we call the, the test pyramid. 
Now, I don't want to hold the test pyramid up as, a, uh, as an absolute truth. But again, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll assume that this is something that I want in, in uh, my tests. Um, I want a, a basically the, uh, the, the bulk of my test suite to be small, isolated unit tests and to have a smaller number of integration tests. Again, what, whatever that might mean to me as a, a different, as, you know, as a type of tester. And uh, I want an even smaller amount of, of full stack you know, UI tests. Um, so this is sort of underlying my assumptions here. But I, I do know a few things about uh, RALS, and it doesn't quite fit in with this model. Um, now let's look at those in turn. The first folder controllers, um, I know that these aren't unit tests because as of RALS 5, um, these are literally integration tests in a folder called controllers. Uh, they're using the same framework. Um, so these are, these are not unit tests. Uh, next we have uh, you know, a bunch of support files, uh, fixtures, helpers, and so on. Um, I'm going to just skip mailers because I don't write a lot of these and I honestly don't know a lot about that. But let, let's assume that's not a core part of your application. Um, which really only leaves us with models. And I've commonly heard that when people say I'm running unit tests for my application, uh, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about their model tests. And I have a couple of problems with that. Um, it doesn't clearly, um, well, it's, it is clearly not a unit test in uh, the eyes of type A, the mockist. Um, because, well, we're quite used to our, um, our models talking to other objects. Um, they have associations and so on. Uh, it's also coupled to Rails you know, Active Record, uh, which is a huge API. Um, so it's not isolated from that. Um, we, we also know that it, um, or they talk freely to the database, and it's encouraged to do that. Um, this brings us a lot of convenience. But it also means it's not a unit test uh, in the eyes of type B. Um, really, the only way that we can see these as, as unit tests are in terms of, of Rails itself as being the, the, you know, the smallest uh, unit um, in, uh, in the context of Rails. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't really like that. I want a more general definition of unit test. Um, and for that reason, it kind of seems to me that these are all integration tests. You may disagree, but <laughs> um, and that, but that's fine. Uh, I have nothing against any of these things individually, and I, I would want all of these test frameworks if I was going to write a Ruby and Rails application. Um, the the problem is that you you just don't have that uh, fine level of granularity um, that we talked about. So, what can we do about this, or why why do, why do we want to do something about this? Um, the reason that, that I think I want finer, finer grain unit tests is really for a couple of reasons. One is that it enforces um, more decoupling or encourages more decoupling in my application. Another reason is that um, if I'm not coupled to things like the database and running every test in a transaction, it means it's going to be a lot faster. Uh, if it's decoupled from Rails, it means I don't have to boot the application and wait you know, uh, 10 seconds uh, just to run a single test. And this is something that I really care about a lot. Um, so what can you do about this? There have been a number of approaches to solving this problem. And uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. But uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one that I particularly like. And I, I like it because it's probably the simplest approach um, and perhaps the least controversial. Um, so we talked about. Um, the idea that your models are all coupled to the database um, and, and to the Rails framework. And, and this is sort of problematic because uh, this is typically where all your business logic goes, right? Um, and that means to, to test like the, the most important stuff in our application, we, we, we have to do these really slow tests that are coupled to the database. Um, so what we can do instead is um, just take all that business logic and strip it out of our models. And what we're left with in those models are basically database wrappers. Um, we're still using the, you know, all the convenience that we get with Rails and so on. Um, but uh, we then take that 
that logic and we can just put those in, in what we call service objects, which are really just plain Ruby objects. Uh, this means we can, we can stub um, those, our, our models out in those tests with uh, high confidence because really uh, those models are now just really fancy data objects. Um, and we have, we've, we've uh, created uh, loose coupling and we've got faster tests. Um, now, there's been a number of other, other approaches to this problem, and I just want to mention those briefly, but I only have time to talk about them all. Um, so, Uncle Bob sort of, uh, well, he gave a, a talk about this a few years ago, where he takes this idea of, of taking a, a service object a little bit further. Uh, Rails um, applications are typically uh, organized in, in the MVC sort of paradigm. Uh, that comes first, so we, you know, in our app folder we see model, a models folder and controllers folder and so on. Um, but uh, Uncle Bob talks about um, uh, making your, your, your business uh, stuff, your, your, uh, your use cases, the, the kind of first, um, first class objects in your, in, in your, in your application. Um, so rather than you know, releasing app models, app controllers and so on, you'd have like app ducks if you, uh, if you had a duck-based application. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, Uncle Bob didn't tell us actually uh, how to do that or give us a working example of that, uh, and he never has since. Um, but um, I believe that that has been sort of crystallized in, in the Trailblazer project, uh, which is a, a, a framework on top of Rails. Um, I never actually used Trailblazer, but I've heard great things about it. Um, so you can try that out, or go look it up if you're interested. Uh, another approach is uh, something that's called a hexagonal rails. I, I, that does come with a, um, a, a kind of big caveat. I believe hexagonal rails, or hexagonal architecture in rails, um, was the source of a big uh, debate a few years ago that caused uh, DHH to uh, pronounce that TDD is dead. Uh, as he saw that um, in departing from like the convenience of the framework, um, people were doing what he called uh, test-driven uh, damage, I think. Um, so, again, I, I haven't done hexagonal rails, but if you are interested in having a more structured approach, um, that's there too. Um, and that's it. Uh, a couple of references. This is the, the Kempex book that I've, I've referenced in this talk. Um, I didn't reference this directly, but uh, Jay Field's book um, was really good. Uh, this one will break your foot if you drop it. Uh, that's also, this is, has all the terms in it too, uh, at least as of when it was written. <laughs> um, if, you want to see, if you want to see two talks that uh, put forward strong arguments for the uh, mockist and the, um, the classicist approach respectively, I really recommend these two. Um, Ian Cooper's TDD, where did it all go wrong? Uh, we, he, he makes a strong argument for using a classicist or a classical approach. Uh, J.B. Rainsberger's uh, integration test for a scam uh, is more of a mock approach. Um, they're both really good talks, even though they seem to directly contradict each other. Uh, I highly recommend going to see those two. Um, this is who I am on the internet, um, on Twitter, GitHub. This is, this is the uh, location of my slides, if you want to see those. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Um, I'm kind of new at uh, developing large applications, but you mentioned moving your uh, business logic into service objects, and I was wondering if you could give uh, just sort of a concrete example of that, uh, a way of separating from your model. Uh, sure. It may be hard to do that without looking at code, but um, uh, let's think. Well, do you, maybe do you have a do you have an example of a of uh, Yeah, so, um, so let's say you have uh, like a number of line items, um, which each have like a, presumably some kind of uh, cost or unit value. Um, rather than put that, that calculation in your model, you can just create a, a Ruby object that takes uh, as an argument uh, a model. And doesn't, you don't need to specify what it is because you're just injecting it. 
uh, and then you choose the attributes from that model um, to, to calculate uh, a total uh, and whatever, whatever other logic you want to do uh, around that would we'll, we'll go on there. Does, does, that, does that help? Yeah, the, the best thing, I did want to do like a high level overview of like different approaches here without getting too concrete, but um, if you did want to explore this, uh, this idea more, um, two good people to check out would be, uh, I think Corey Haynes gave a really good talk about this, and uh, Gary Bernhardt has also given num made a number of screencasts uh, about this approach uh, that he does in great detail, so I uh, highly recommend checking those out. Anyone else? Yes. It, it, yeah, it really depends. Um, it, it depends on like your your style too. Um, so uh, one of the things, so like the, the criticism of like the the Marcus approach uh, that people say is that it's coupled to implementation. Um, now there's there's a more um, uh, there's a more like subtle um, way of saying that, um, which is basically that rather than being coupled to your implementation, it's coupled to your interfaces. Um, so, uh, and it's precisely like through stubbing and, and mocking uh, that like you're, you're saying you're not interested in implementation. I just want a canned answer. I just. So you're saying, so you're saying, you're saying like if you stub it, you said this object will receive message X mm -hmm. and return something. You're not you're coupled to that. Like your, your object has to receive X. Right. It, it, so it's coupled to the implementation as far as that relationship, um, but it's not coupled to um, the, any, any further implementation, I guess. Um, so, um, if you accept that it's coupled to the, the, the interface, uh, you might decide that you actually don't, that's something you don't want to change. Um, um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, every, every test is going to be somewhat coupled. Uh, it just really depends on like your architectural style and what you identify as things that you might want to change. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, it's, it's a complex problem. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully that, um, that, that helps a little bit. Okay, anyone else? All right, thank you very much.